So, hey, everybody, uh, thanks for joining and, and thanks for Campco for hosting. It, it's kind of like the perfect storm over the last year or two, so to speak, no pun intended, right? The, you know, with Ida as a perfect example of what can happen and how it could just devastate buildings and even buildings that aren't in a flood zone or the tornadoes in the Midwest, the wildfires, you know, out West, the pandemic, which has resulted in what we'll call social inflation, which is uh, a term used for higher lawsuits and judgments and more claims uh, being made by individuals uh, and businesses around the country. Uh, you've just seen it all. And, and insurance companies uh, are still in the business to make a profit. And interest rates are as low, if, if not the lowest I've ever seen. And so their investment income really isn't there. And they have to make a profit. And with all these losses and reinsurance rates going up, so they, they don't take on the full risk in just about every case, they try to push off to uh, a third party, similar to you, pushing off your risk to your insurance company, they do the same thing. So they're not constantly on you know, a total loss. So their rates have gone up on reinsurance. Uh, and all these factors combined have resulted in the insurance marketplace just turned upside down. Uh, what I find interesting is that the community association class of business has seen the lowest rate increases of any type of business that we insure um, based on the stability of the property uh, that you have. So property rates, although up, aren't up similar to cyber and directors and officers liability and other specialty items and areas um, that we have seen not just 10% rate increases, but 100 to 500% rate increases. So overall, even though you're seeing rate increases in, in four community associations, Julia, it's nowhere near as bad as what we're seeing for other industries. Great. So you kind of uh, led into my next question here, and, and we get this pretty often. Um, have you ever seen, historically, ever seen insurance rates go down? Um, Most people are going to say, no, they always go up. But, but believe it or not, yes. I mean, when you look even at the rates level that you have right now for a budget, if you compare that total premium, based on the total premium that you were likely paying five years ago, the, the total cost is probably pretty similar because for years we saw rate reductions because of competition, loss history was okay, insurance companies were trying to get as much production as possible. And, I, and we all know that when there's more competition things go down, whether it's insurance or the cost of your landscaping, or if you're doing a renovation on your home and there's more people bidding for it, that has a positive impact. So for years, we have seen insurance rates go down and that's pretty typical. Insurance can be cyclical. And what, we're, what we typically see is a gradual increase going up into what's called a hard market. But because of the pandemic and all the other uh, factors that I mentioned earlier, that rate of increase this year has been greater and more steep than in any other year that I can remember in the past 30 years. So I suspect that as things start to settle down, we also have to remember that the rate that you're paying today is probably based on a much higher limit of insurance that you had in years past uh, because of the cost to replace property is significantly higher, materials, et cetera, are in labor. You know, you, you all know if you're doing anything, the cost to replace a roof or facade or anything is significantly more than in the past. So you very well may have had 10 years ago, a building limit of 50 million, and today it could literally be 80 or 90 million, just based on the total cost to replace versus what it was years ago. And so you're also seeing that factor in to the premium increases as well. 
But there's no doubt in my mind that eventually insurance rates will start to come down again. And that will, will, could, be to, could be next year. It could be in six months, depending on what we see with inflation, interest rates, and all the other factors that we talked about earlier. Great. You partially answered part of my next question, um, which was going to be on uh, increases, you know, what you're seeing for average rate increases, I guess, based on the type of property um, or type of uh, coverage, I mean. So um, if you have those averages, please let us know. And that was going to be my next comment too, is what I personally with my specific associations are with the property coverage we're seeing an increase, but mainly due to the building limit increase, like you said. So to rebuild everything, it would cost more. Yeah, so here's the good news. The areas where we're seeing the largest increases are on the premiums that affect the budget the least. So where we're seeing the largest increases are on umbrella liability. I mean, it's kind of silly when you think about it. You know, $100 million umbrella liability policy for ten thousand dollars, and you're like, well, that can't make sense. How can an insurance company or companies give that much limit of coverage for a catastrophic claim and only charge ten thousand dollars? Well, it was because there was a lot of real estate umbrella programs out there, and they were all fighting for the business. Well, now they've lost their capacity. They've lost a lot of their carriers. Many of those programs have shut down. And so that same 100 million today may be 15,000. So maybe a 5,000 increase, but that's a 50% increase. But because it makes up a small component of the overall insurance for many of the associations, it's not a big monetary output versus let's say your property and general liability premium where we're seeing modest increases um, three to 5% if you have a good loss ratio. And if uh, you have a lower deductible, those increases can easily be offset by increasing deductibles it's from, let's say, 10 to 25,000 or putting in a per unit water damage deductible to offset some of those increases. So, really, only on directors and officers liability insurance and umbrella are we seeing those significant increases? But again, because they make up, Julia, a small percentage of the overall premium for most associations that have a big property exposure or liability, general liability exposure, uh, it is insignificant in the big scheme of things. So great. So you touched on a couple of items um, that could potentially help, I guess we'll say, uh, the association to be proactive regarding these um, coverage or premium increases. What are some other things that associations could do to basically be proactive about preventing increases or, or trying to lower increases in the future? So when we sell insurance companies on who the best of the best are. Obviously, and this is, this is going to be a plug for Campco, obviously we sell the property management team. So having a really good property manager helps. Insurance companies wanna know that it's not necessarily a self-managed association, that the board is making all the decisions without any oversight whatsoever. So having a, an, an exceptional property management team that understands all of this, the insurance companies absolutely factor that into how they're going to, um, to rate and quote an account. Importantly, amending your rules and regulations to help prevent losses. So if you don't have a rule or regulation that mandates if, let's say, for the sake of this example, there are hot water heaters in the building, a hot water heater replacement program, uh, if you don't have a rule and regulation as regards to stainless steel braided washing machine hoses, if you don't have a rule and regulation that they're also replaced every five to eight years or seven to ten years, if you don't have a rule and regulation about keeping heat on at a minimum of 55 degrees or higher, uh, these are the types of things that should be implemented 
because these rules and regulations we then show to the insurer to say, hey, look at what this building is doing. Uh, many of our buildings that have had a lot of water damage claims because of the aging infrastructure or just unit owners that aren't maintaining their, their unit, they're not exercising their toilet supply lines, they're not caulking around their toilet on a regular basis. Um, what ends up happening is you see more claims, more frequency. And so many of the buildings now are having a, a, a plumber do plumbing inspections for each and every unit. And uh, obviously billing that back to the owners and then uh, coming up with a report. And that report goes to the building. And those, those owners then have to either, they have to fix it. If they could use their own plumber, of course, or they can use the plumber that did the inspection. That's up to them. But this is also something that uh, we are recommending to, to show yourself in the best light to the insurance companies. Because I think worst case scenario, unfortunately, what if the soft market doesn't come for another five years? What if we just continue to sustain hard market? What if this weather, re, uh, these weather changes are the norm moving forward and not the exception given climate change? So we as owners have to do everything we possibly can to convince the insurance companies that we're the best of the best. And, and clearly you also don't want unit owner to unit owner claims. You want things, you don't want claims. They're, they, they, they're not good for the association. Nobody likes it and they're easy to prevent. So that's one area. Great financials. So if you have stable financials, insurance companies are looking to say, hey, are they financially capable of, of doing these projects, of replacing their roof timely, of doing a facade project, of fixing a riser, you know, something that's expensive, of, of repairing the garage issue, if you have a garage, of doing maintenance outside. You know, we may have a lot of residential board members here today. You know, we're not just talking about structure. What about redoing the parking lot, taking care of cracks and sidewalks? All these things require money. And so if an insurance company looks at your financials and they're good, that's going to help you. Um, reserve studies, showing the insurance companies that you have a plan and that that reserve study isn't from 2016 and that it's been updated now in 2021. Um, these are all areas, Julia, that can absolutely help. Great. So to follow up with that question, um, how often should should you as a broker market the policies out to different carriers? The answer is it really depends. And, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to be vague. We do not want you to be a transaction, a piece of paper with your insurer. We want them to partner with you. We want them to be on your account for the long term in good years and in years where you have losses. So that's our goal. It's not to switch every year for $1,000 less. But that assumes that you're happy with your insurer. And that's assuming that they've done everything good by you and that they've paid your claims and that they're still rated A or A plus or A plus plus. So assuming that, and assuming that they've treated you well over the years. We don't recommend that you market every year because then ins insurance companies say, well, they're just gonna market every year and they're just looking for price. So if you can get an early response by your insurer well in advance of your renewal, and what's well in advance today? It's not two weeks before, it's not a month before, it's two or three months before, hey, we're looking at a three or 4% rate increase this year. Um, and you come to me and say, Ken, what's market today? And I said, well, market's like six or seven. Yeah. Then you probably shouldn't market. If you've had a bad experience with that insurer, or it's been at least two or three years since you've done a full marketing out, out to the marketplace, then I recommend doing a full marketing um, every two, but likely three years. Um, oftentimes what we'll do just to keep the carrier honest, if a new insurer has come into the marketplace that we feel very comfortable with, that's being aggressive, 
we may go and submit to that one insurer, not to 15, just to block the market, uh, which a lot of insurance brokers do, but go to the ones that might get a fresh look at you that haven't seen you before. So that's why I said, Julia, the answer really depends. But certainly, I caution you, do not market every year. It, it, it only puts you in a bad light with the insurance companies. They will see your submission every year and just say, why should we write this association when they're only going to market us next year? They don't want to be treated like a transaction either. Great. And something that I just uh, thought of, if you could maybe explain to everybody here what you meant by uh, brokers blocking the market, just because some may not understand that. Um, yeah. So we're realistic, although we hope in, in, that you trust us if we're your broker enough to do the marketing for you and that we're going to get you the best coverage and price, et cetera. We do understand every now and again that you may go to another broker to, to provide alternative quotations, testing the waters, what else is out there? Um, and that's fine, and that's your right. But what some brokers do is that when they get a hint that you're going to market, which is, can you send me the loss runs? Um, they, the incumbent broker will then literally, immediately drop everything because they know that that means that you're marketing them. And they're gonna to go to 10 or 15 insurance companies to block the market. So that other broker has nowhere else to go. And so if you decide to go out to market, what my recommendation would be is tell your incumbent broker, look, we like you, pick your top three or so. What are your top three or four? And then give them those. And then let the other broker say, what's your top four? After these, these markets are taken, go to them. And there you get the fair competition and it, and it dissuades that incumbent broker from blocking the market so you can't get other quotes. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn it to Dennis. Uh, we're gonna talk about some types of insurance policies and uh, what kind of claims and trends we're seeing in the, uh, in the market today. So- um, Julia, did, Sorry, Julia, before we do that, uh, William, oh. you had your, your hand raised. Was there a question you wanted to ask? Oh, hang on, you gotta, un let me unmute you for- I can do that. I'm unmuted now. You're unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> we, we live in a cluster condo and there are up, uh, upstairs residents and downstairs residents. In the event that, let's say, a hot water heater broke and it dripped down and uh, went into the lower residence, that is between the two residents. Where does that come into our uh, association yearly? Um, payment where they increase it I, that doesn't make sense that's why you have insurance that's why you have renters insurance so i don't know how that comes in between uh our premiums why our premiums will go up that's between so, the two yeah. unit owners it it's complicated but i'll try and make it as, as simplified as best i can it's illogical but based on the pennsylvania uniform condominium act and the condominium or community association declarations. Regardless of negligence, the association is responsible to insure the unit for any property damage that is caused by any unit owner due to their negligence, uh, obviously a common element failure, et cetera, subject to the association's deductible. So William, in that scenario that you provided, which is, hey, their hot water heater blew, maybe it was negligent, maybe it's not. Maybe it was three years old and it was just you know, a bad water heater. Maybe it was 15 years old and they were supposed to place it after eight. And that is negligence. Um, and your unit is damaged. Well, you need to then turn that claim into your homeowner's carrier, Julia or Lauren or property manager for that particular property will notify Dash and Love or whoever the broker is. 
depending on the amount of damage, we will file a claim with the association's carrier because they are responsible to pay everything over and above the deductible in that situation for the damage to the unit's original specifications. So it's been put in the act and put in the documents, I think to protect the building and the neighbors. So as if someone didn't maintain homeowner's insurance, that at the very least, there would be insurance coverage to put that unit back together again, based on how it was originally conveyed when the developer conveyed it to that original unit owner. So I hope that answers your question. Now, so necessary, your, your insurance carrier can and likely will subrogate against the alleged negligent owner whose hot water heater broke in that scenario. So you could get your deductible back. Perhaps you had a couch or a rug that was damaged as well. Perhaps you have betterments and improvements that weren't covered by the master association's policy that you were reimbursed by your insurance carrier. So there will be no doubt that your insurer, the, the, the unit that was affected by that loss, will subrogate against that negligent uh, unit owner. And if they are deemed to be negligent, you will be made whole. Stephen has his hand up, I believe. All right, Stephen, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. All right, thanks guys for uh, doing this for us tomorrow. I am in the insurance business, so I understand a little bit how nuts it is out there. But my question is, uh, and this could either be answered by either Ken or Dennis, is what impact or what's your take on the cyber liability that's going on so severely right now? It is the impact for associations is nominal because you don't carry a lot of personal identifiable information, even the largest associations, it's a nominal exposure. The impact for every other industry, healthcare, colleges, schools, regular businesses um, is tremendous because Steve, in the insurance companies over the years started insuring for what we call first party coverage in the same way that they were insuring for third party coverage. What's first party coverage? Ransomware, business interruption, um, you know, any kind of phishing scheme where all your data is compromised. All of these have caused complete turmoil in the cyber industry. Fortunately, we have built in, and you should all have built in, to either your directors and officers' liability policy, general liability policy, or a standalone policy, cyber. But it is not expensive for an association. You don't have to fill out extensive applications, just given the nature of, of the personal information that you carry, the number of records, and what you do. Uh, my recommendation, though, and I know that Camco does it, any property manager should have what's called MFA, which is multi-factor authentication. So you can't be backdoored or they can't be backdoored or have a phishing issue um, based on they have multiple ways that they have to get into an account. They just can't get into your account and get into your money without going through multiple steps to make sure that it's them and that it's not some hacker out there that has gotten into Lauren or Julia's email and now can easily get into one of your accounts. So Camco to a person has and has gone through multi-factor authentication. And that is critical today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have... Yeah, we have a question. Just, they're asking questions. All right. Sorry. Um, we had a question come in and also it kind of tied in with something else that you said as well. So uh, we had a question on we have no subrogation in our documents between neighbors. Is that pretty normal? And then I also wanted to ask in line with the subrogation. Uh, yeah. 
for you to explain how the master the association's policy does not subrogate against the uh sure so yeah it's becoming I, I've seen it in, in, in many documents that there is a waiver of subrogation from owner to owner other than perhaps your deductible. And the reason why that was put in a lot of the documents was because they didn't want, when I say they, the lawyers and the developers and whoever put the documents together, perhaps it, it certainly wasn't the original board, um, meaning post-transfer, was because they didn't want infighting in a community. They didn't want there to be constant suing between neighbors. And so they put this waiver of subrogation in between neighbors and, uh, and owners because they just, they didn't want a neighbor to be suing another neighbor. And they felt, okay, the association has insurance coverage. We, you have insurance coverage, stuff happens. Everyone's negligent from time to time, including myself. Um, and, and that's why we've seen it. So is it common? I'd say it's common. It, you wouldn't be an anomaly if your association had it, put it that way. And then your second question, Julia, was again, what? Just to explain how um, uh, the unit owner's individual policies can subrogate, but yeah. they can subrogate against the there's, man. The, there's a trade-off. So right. one of the, I think, perks of, of having the waiver is that the association and the association's carrier cannot subrogate against a negligent owner. And, and that's important. And why is that important? You might say, well, that's not fair. I mean, if they caused a million dollars of damage to the building, then, then why should this go on our record of insurance? Because their, their cat knocked over, knocked over. a, a, a uh, candle. And the answer is because you all pay association fees. And those fees go to pay for the insurance for the master policy. And the, the industry, the, the, the legislators that put together the Condo Act felt it was unfair to go after an individual for millions of dollars because they probably didn't have it. And, and many, many people don't carry multi-million dollars of umbrella liability insurance. And when you're in a building where you could cause millions and millions of dollars of damage because a fire starts because you left something in your microwave and it caused a fire, that's the reason, Julia. And um, just didn't think it was fair with one caveat that they can subrogate for the deductible. So if there's damage to the common area, and let's say the association carries a $25,000 deductible, the association in many cases, if not in most cases, can go after and, and, and assess and get the deductible paid for. And the homeowner's carrier for that owner, that would pay for that. Great, thank you. Uh, Patrick, do you have your hand up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, this goes back to the question that Bill had earlier. Uh, you know, when we talk about the master agreement insurance for the association, question I have here, we have a small association. Homes were built in 1985, the condos. One encourages or encounters a loss. They say that all of our owners here should have HO6 insurance which would cover the additional cost to get the property back or beyond the uh, improvements made. What is the basis? Of, do you go back to 1985 when the, the condo association was built? Or how do you factor in the increase? If they're saying that, the, I guess I'm trying to, since I'm new to this uh, old game, um, how do I know uh, what that value is that the insurance company will place on the basics uh, of the unit. Is that clear? It is. Um, you ask a question that is asked all the time. What do we know what the original specs are? You, so you have to go back to 1985 and I'll make an assumption that it was likely builder's grade. 
I'm just, you know, if, if, if you tell me, say, Patrick, Ken, you know, this laminate countertops, it was, it was builder's grade cabinetry, you know, nothing special in the bathroom, no special fixtures, then it's likely builder's grade. And so the insurance company will insure for builder's grade. So you don't have to worry about that. What you have to worry about is what's the difference between builder's grade today and what you may have in your unit today. So if you now have um, a marble or granite countertop, you have to insure for the difference or delta between builder's grade today and high-end marble or granite today. And so you would ask your personal insurance broker, whoever that may be, to help you determine that. So if your unit is been upgraded either by you or a previous owner, and you now have beautiful tile floor or beautiful hardwoods, and you've got you know wonderful, you put in a beautiful chandelier. Um, these are all things that you have to factor in and discuss. And any personal insurance broker will have the wherewithal to provide you with some guidance based on what you have today versus what may have been original specs builders grade. I guess the question is the original specs. If we talk about a countertop in 1985, builders grade mm -hmm. was say, just for the sake of the example, $1,000. In 2021, a countertop at builders grade is now $1,500. Does the basic homeowner's insurance say, hey, we go with that $1,500, not go all the way back to $1,000 of 1985? That's so the master's, no, the master association's policy will cover that builder's grade laminate countertop at what it costs to replace it in 2021, not 1985. Great. You answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dennis now. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, you're <All> right. fired. <laughs> so Dennis, we, we just, uh, kind of went over some, some of the topics that we were going to cover, um, under types of insurance policies. Um, and we touched briefly on some PA condo act, um, talk as well. So, if you can just give us the basics, right? So what are the basic uh, types of insurance policies association should have? Well, as Ken so eloquently put it, it's going to be the requirements of the association to insure are gonna be laid out in their documents and either the PA Act or the New Jersey Act, depending on, on where the association is. Uh, at a minimum, the association is going to have to provide general liability coverage for the common areas. They're going to have to provide directors and officers liability coverage uh, to protect the association, the board, and the property manager for their decisions in uh, running the association. Uh, they're also going to have to provide coverage for employee theft. Um, that's uh, the theft of association funds by a management employee or a board member. Uh, we also strongly recommend that each of the carrier or each of the associations uh, provide or get coverage for umbrella liability. Uh, this is additional or excess liability coverage that typically goes over the general liability and the directors and officers liability. Because let's be honest, um, in today's day and age, the way suits are and settlements run, a million dollars really isn't a large sum of money. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the directors and officers and the associations are covered. Um, you know, the uh, umbrella policy would provide additional coverage over that. Now, depending on how your documents are written, uh, you may be, or I should say the association may be responsible for ensuring the units up to their original specifications, just as Ken mentioned in his earlier example, uh, they may also be responsible for ensuring the entire unit, including improvements and betterments. Some uh, association documents require this. Uh, so it is really important that your broker uh, read and understand the documents 
uh, so that you have the proper coverage because what you don't want is you, we don't want the association to have a claim and there not be the proper coverage in place. Hey, Dennis, could you just touch on briefly why we feel it's important for associations to maintain workers' compensation insurance even when they may not have any employees? Well, they still have a workers' compensation or employer's liability, really, exposure. Um, yes, you're right. They, they may not have employees, but they have volunteers uh, that could be on the landscape committee. They could be on, uh, you know, other committees outside doing, doing work for the association on the association's behalf. Somebody slips and falls and gets hurt and now has medical bills. Um, you know, those medical bills should be taken care of and will need to be taken care of. And that workers' comp policy would trigger coverage to, um, you know, provide medical coverage for uh, that individual. In addition, I know CAMCO does a fantastic job with regards to obtaining certificates of insurance from their contractors. Unfortunately, certificates of insurance are only valid for the day in which they're issued. You know, three days, five days, 10 days later, that policy could be canceled for underwriting reasons, uh, non-payment, um, there's a laundry list of, of reasons that that uh, policy could be canceled. And the association would never be notified, neither would CAMCO. So that landscaper who provided the coverage uh, pro or proof of coverage weeks ago is now working uh, in your association, but lo and behold to you, they don't have workers' comp coverage. Now their employee uh, slips and falls, uh, hurts their back, and now there's no health coverage, there's no uh, loss of wage coverage for that employee. That employee is gonna not only bring suit against the employer, but they very well could bring suit against the association because technically they were working for the association. Great, thank you, Dennis. And that kind of, so kind of leads us into my next question. So- what Can I ask a question about that? Sure, go ahead, Marvin. How as an association do you mitigate that risk of a contractor not having insurance. Is there anything you can do? Well, there, there are two things you can do. One, you can ask for certificates of insurance. Those are, you know, without a doubt, you, you have to have certificates of insurance from your contractors because yeah. you have to make you sure- You say that's that, good for the first day, but after that, possibly. Right, right. But at least you're doing your due diligence. It, it can be shown that you're doing your due diligence and that you've actually uh, you know, try to verify that they have coverage. If it, if it cancels or it non-renews, um, the uh, best way to do it is to protect yourself, which would be either to have workers' comp coverage and, and to have uh, liability coverage. Uh, May I know, interject, it, Dennis, because I have one other way. It, oftentimes on projects um, or with Vent, uh, with with vendors that you use on a regular basis, uh, you may only have a purchase order. And so what my recommendation is, Marvin, is to have as much risk transfer as you can. So if there's any lawyers on this on this call, you'll know what I mean by risk transfer and contractual documents. And having an indemnification provision put in where you're transferring that risk to that vendor could be a plumber, could be a landscaper, could be whomever, snow removal, whatever it may be, and having in insurance requirements in there as well. So if their insurance lapse, Marvin, they have a contractual requirement to defend, hold harmless, indemnify you for their negligence and have a waiver where they can't sue you. In addition, that agreement requires insurance coverage. And so oftentimes, we say, put an addendum on the purchase order. You know, if, if they don't have a fancy agreement because it's not a big roofing contract or not a big garage replacement contract, but in my opinion, every snow removal vendor, landscaper, any major contract that you have, we will help or your broker will help look at the insurance and indemnification clauses to transfer that risk back. So if that scenario happens, 
even though you may carry a work comp policy and you have your own insurance coverage, you will know and have that transfer in place contractually. And I think that would be uh, a, another good thing to do. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks, Marvin. Um, so I, I actually have a follow-up question on that. Should we be uh, mandating or requiring higher coverage amounts or more specifics uh, within these contracts than sort of we typically have in the past? Or even with certain communities, we require um, waivers or um, you know, certificates of insurance for uh, ARC requests for, say, homeowners that are replacing windows on their on their property, um, but they're getting work done within the association. Yeah, so we can provide uh, each of the property managers with a sample certificate of insurance that the uh, associations should be asking their contractors uh, to pro provide proof of. Uh, at a minimum, it should be a million dollars for general liability coverage. Uh, a minimum $1 million limit for umbrella, and of course, workers' comp uh, statutory uh, limits. Now, depending on what the contractor is doing for the association, uh, there may be uh, additional uh, coverages required. Uh, if they're a landscaper and they're uh, putting down herbicides or pesticides, they should be carrying pollution liability coverage. Uh, if they're a valet and they're providing uh, valet services for the association, they should have garage keepers and uh, automobile liability coverage. So it's going to depend strongly on what they're actually doing for the association and the scope of the, the work. Great. And, and, to, and to go back to, to Ken's uh, last statement, um, you know, the agreement or the contract really should state that the contractor is indemnifying, defending, and holding the association harmless, and in addition, naming you as additional insured. Uh, and, and their coverage should be primary and non-contributory. Um, that's something else we can, we can help you uh, with, uh, with the wording for the contracts. Uh, but, you know, I really strongly suggest having your uh, association's attorney review any contracts prior to executing them. Great. So let's get into the interesting stuff. What kind of uh, claims and trends are you seeing right now? Well, unfortunately, Ken hit on one of them already, which is uh, water damage. We are seeing water damage claims left and right. And it doesn't matter whether it's coming from a common element failure where a pipe just breaks in the, in the wall or if it's a sewer and drain backup. Um, unfortunately, these claims, um, they happen a lot and they tend to happen to multiple units when they do happen. And uh, they really can cause damage to not only the association's property, but also to their loss history. And it's one of um, the items that we've been strongly trying to get uh, associations to consider, which is a per unit water damage deductible. And the reason that we're recommending that is multifold. Number one, um, if you have a per occurrence deductible, and let's say there are seven or eight units affected, uh, that deductible is prorated amongst all of the units that are affected. So that you, those unit owners won't, will not know how much of the deductible they're responsible for until all of the damages have been calculated. So it could literally be weeks before they know how much of a deductible they're responsible for. With the per uh, unit deductible, you already know. It's, it's automatic. $5,000, $10,000, whatever the deductible amount is. The second reason, and this is the most important reason, is it really helps keep the association's loss history down and keep them insurable. Because what we don't want is the association not to be insurable. And if, if for what, it, you know, for 
if they cannot get a standard carrier to insure them, they're going to wind up in the surplus lines market, and we don't want that. Um, surplus lines carriers, uh, typically your premium is going to double. Your coverages are going to be minimal at best, and you're not going to get the claim service that you would from a, a traveler's or a chub. Uh, so it's really important that we keep the loss histories as clean as we possibly can. Uh, and as an example, we just had a high rise luxury condominium association in Center City. They had a uh, pressure valve break and water gushed into nine different units. The adjuster calls me the other day, says, I got some good news for you and I got some bad news. The good news is, only, and this association had a uh, per unit water damage deductible. The good news is only two of the units are above the deductible. So immediately I'm thinking, this is great. You know, the association is going to uh, not have a large loss on their, their loss history. You know, everybody's going to go to their HO6 carriers and be made whole. The bad news is those two units, they have continuous hardwood flooring throughout them and the hardwood flooring has been destroyed. So now the hardwood flooring has to be replaced in those two units. The damage amount on the first estimate is $100,000 for two units. I asked the adjuster, what would it have been if all nine units had been affected and we didn't have this per unit water damage deductible? She said easily it would have been 175,000. So you can see right there in that example where the per unit water damage deductible almost cut the damages in half that the association's carrier would have had to pay out. So Dennis, with that, uh, with that in mind, so we get this question a lot. What, how does it affect the individual HO6 policies or homeowners policies when you increase the deductible or change it to a per unit deductible? Well, it, it, it what it does is it, limits or it lowers the chances of uh, uh, large claims being put on the association's loss history. And like I said before, this is what we're trying to, to avoid uh, happening. Dennis, and, I, think I, see, I, I think I can answer that question for Julia because I think she's going in a different direction, which is how much more money is someone going to have to pay on their homeowner's insurance policy if they, if the association goes from a 10,000 per occurrence deductible to a 10,000 per unit, and the answer is zero. Um, how much will it cost uh, on the on the homeowner's carrier on the homeowner's policy to increase the responsibility the deductible from 10,000 to 25,000, five dollars, fifteen dollars a year, virtually nothing. How will it affect our record if we pay out on, if my homeowner's carrier pays out on a $10,000 claim um, that I'm now responsible for? Well, if you've been with that insurance carrier for a long time, they may not increase you at all. Um, so it is not, does not affect the individual homeowner from a cost standpoint, if at all, uh, and virtually nothing on a claim, uh, just due to the fact that it's a $10,000 claim. It's not a, a multi-million dollar claim if you're, if you're, when we're talking about the deductible. So I hope that answers your question, Julia. I, I thought that was yeah, where you were going with it. It was. I'm sorry. I phrased it a little funny. Um, we did, uh, I, I don't want to bring us into Surfside because I, I think we'll run out of time, but um, I did want to ask, how can boards help their uh, homeowners understand that claims increase um, insurance premiums? Like how, what would you suggest boards do to help relay that to the homeowners to try to mitigate? Bring out uh, a third party to speak with the owners and uh, it, you know whether it's the management company or the broker to be blunt, candid, professional that as owners here, you're costing us not only additional monies that you have to pay for, but B, you're causing soreness or pain to your neighbors. And this can't go on forever 
because if it does, you're going to be subrogated against potentially, which will affect your liability insurance on your policy. And all you have to do is simply maintain what you're supposed to maintain, which is your unit. The broker can help by putting together with the help of the head of maintenance of your association, a prevent a unit preventative maintenance checklist. And it can put in layman's terms for that particular property, what that owner can and should be doing to protect and maintain their unit that they may just never think about. They may not know where their shutoff valves are if there's a water claim coming from their washing machine. They may not know what it means to exercise a supply line. They may not know you know, where to even, uh, you know, how to turn their heat on vacation at 60 degrees. So there's a lot of things that can be learned by a preventative checklist. And in that, when you send it out to the owners, you can also explain why you're sending it out, why it's important. And I think those are two ways to help communicate it, Julia, you know, in person, and actually take the time to send out a checklist so someone who maybe doesn't know what to do can easily then just do it. Um, don't turn off, because what we've seen is if you have an exercise that toilet supply line and, and all of a sudden there's a leak in that toilet and it's starting to overflow and you go to turn off the supply line and it hasn't been exercised in 10 years, the likelihood it's gonna break and then you're gonna have a really major water claim on your hand. And then they're not going to know where the shutoff valve is. Right. Um, we did get a question that came in, a good question. So does the cost of fighting a suit get charged as a loss, even if you win the suit? So I guess the attorney's cost that the... Yes. So um, just for the attorney's cost, yes. I guess. I mean, okay. directors and officers liability claims, Dennis didn't have, I didn't give Dennis a, a chance because I talked too much, but Dennis <laughs> was going to bring up directors and officers liability claims as another area where we're seeing a ton of claims. Um, this could be, I think people have just gotten crazy, but you know, the pandemic will do that to, to you. And we're seeing more lawsuits, um, board members suing board members, um, people that didn't win an election saying it was fraud, um, you know, whatever. And so you have to defend these things. You have to turn them in. And keeping in mind that you've got, you're paying two or three thousand dollars a year in many cases for the directors and officers liability insurance with a thousand or five thousand dollar deductible, it doesn't take much to build up uh, a large defense expenses uh, to defend that frivolous, ridiculous, absurd situation. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as. You, you, I want a support animal. And you're telling me I can't have the support animal because you don't have a valid doctor's note which says you really need a support animal in a non-pet friendly building. Well, that we're seeing lawsuits left and right just on that alone. And so the expenses to defend that could be 15, 20, 25, $30,000 before it's finally settled. And that of course, the insurance company bears the brunt of that, and they're going to increase your premium and potentially increase your deductible on that policy if they continue to see frequency and severity. 